Let's get started. Uh, let's start it. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we are going to talk about IoT, uh, about cloud, and about Python, of course. And this is my first PyCon, so thanks a lot for having me. Uh, a few details about us. So my name is Laurent Picard. As you can hear, I'm French. Uh, I live in Paris. You can follow me on Twitter uh, at Picard Paris. And I work for Google. Uh, I joined them uh, one year and a half ago, about. And before that, in a previous life, um, I worked 17 years uh, in the ebook industry. So I was, I was one of the first makers in Europe uh, of an ebook device. It was a big tablet of one kilogram. So now you know, you all know about Kindles, Cybooks, and so on. So small devices that, that work well. So it kept me biz busy for 17 years. And as you can guess, I did a lot of embedded development, uh, a bit of hardware, and eventually, uh, cloud, because uh, devices got connected with time, they had Wi-Fi, okay. Um, and now at Google, I focus on cloud solutions, cloud architecture, cloud uh, services, and, and I love, love to talk to developers. But enough uh, talking about me, a bit about you. So who in the audience is a developer? Raise your hands. Yeah, majority of you. Uh, who has a Raspberry? Okay, okay, no, no big deal, you can use anything. Uh, who is using anything else, another IoT device? I'm sure there, there, there's more than that. You must have an assistant at home, a Google Home and Alexa or something, something else, okay. Uh, and who is, who is using cloud services? Okay, okay, so, so you might know a few notions, cool. Uh, the ag agenda is pretty simple. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, I want to show you. So a quick introduction and then, and then some action, okay? Um, regarding the Raspberry Pi. So Raspberry Pi is a foundation uh, based in the UK. They were one of the first uh, to make a credit, size, uh, credit card sized uh, computer, very small one. And maybe they were the only one to be that successful. Uh, as, of, as of today, they've sold over 19 million Raspberry Pi. So a, a, lot, a big, big success. Uh, there have been a few versions. The latest one uh, uh, was released last March, uh, and uh, it's around 35 bucks. Okay, so small one. If you can see, there's one right here before my laptop. But you can use anything. Uh, it's almost always the same story. There are many alternatives. Uh, you can check here. There are small, smaller ones, low-cost ones for five or ten dollars that you could get. And there are high-end ones that you can buy for $200, maybe. But the Raspberry Pi is really the, the nice spot. It's cheap. It works really well. Um, on top of that, I used the Rainbow Hat. So it's a small peripheral with some sensors. So some inputs. There are uh, capacitive buttons. Uh, there are two sensors, temperature and pressure. There are some outputs, uh, LEDs, uh, and also segmented displays. So I chose that. It's made by uh, Pi Moroni, okay, also a UK-based company. It means Pirate, Monkey, Robot, and Ninja, okay. So sounds fun. Okay, and regarding the cloud, so the principles I'm going to show you are pretty much generic. Uh, so it almost works the same uh, everywhere. Uh, at Google, we have uh, this kind of family. So what you can first see is that we love hexagons. And if they are blue, it's even better, okay? So the, the family is pretty big. Uh, you have um, everything related to computing, to big data, uh, even machine learning, uh, storage and databases, but then also uh, anything related to project management, networking, uh, and of course, uh, develop, developer tools, okay? So I'm going to show you a few hexagons here uh, in practice. But some action, that's what I prefer. So I have my Pi here. I have a high-definition camera just to show you the Pi that is plugged here, okay? And uh, we're going to start not from scratch, but first promise, uh, sorry, no servers are going to be harmed during this demo, so that's my small joke about serverless. So who knows uh, what serverless means? A few of you, okay. Okay, so serverless means uh, that you can use a cloud but you don't care about servers, you just care about services. So it means that you can focus on what you know 
to do. Uh, you can focus on code. You don't care about servers. It will be managed automatically by some experts, okay? So the service will be up and running all the time, or almost. And uh, you focus on what you love, and also it will scale automatically. If you have a lot of success, then it will scale up, but also scale down. If nobody uses your uh, services, then it will scale down to zero instances, and so you will not pay anything. So it's also efficient from a money point of view. Okay. Uh, second promise, this is hardware, so a Raspberry Pi might be harmed during this demo. Um, I hope not, but I told you, okay? Um, okay, so we c what you can remember is that you can really start from scratch. What the Raspberry Pi is, is a board, but um, you can actually start from scratch with a micro SD card. That's all you need. If you want to start from scratch, you format uh, the, the card. You s install the Noobs uh, distribution. It takes five minutes. Then you put the micro SD card into the Pi. You boot it up, and then you choose the distribution, the OS that you want. So for instance, Raspbian. So Raspbian is a Debian for Raspberry. It's pretty neat. Uh, and then it will boot up. It takes 12 minutes. So we are going to wait for 12. No, OK, no, no joke. Uh, it's already set up. But it's interesting because you can start with a fresh OS that has already many, many updates. OK? Then you have to choose the way you're going to work with your IoT device. If you're at home, maybe you have uh, different uh, displays, monitors, and so on, a big desk, so you can work in desktop mode. Uh, here I'm traveling, so I don't have many space, uh, much space, uh, so I'm working in headless mode. So just the Pi and just my laptop, okay? And of course, you can also use remote desktop, but before you start to work in headless, there are two things you need, SSH and serial. They are not enabled by default. So the display I used here, I used it only once, and to enable SSH and serial, and then I, I could be up and running with my Pi. Okay. So you know, everybody knows the Murphy's Laws, right? So if you work in headless mode, really, 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 uh, you need to have a serial console, Otherwise, things will, give, will get bad, and it will always be at the worst time when you actually need to do something and, and you won't be able to do anything. So uh, first advice, you really need to buy a serial cable. So that's a small cable here that I plugged to the Pi. It's 10 bucks, so <laughs> it's pretty uh, cheap. And it's only four wires, but it can be uh, connected to any USB device. Of course, here it's an old USB, but there are more modern equivalents. Okay, the serial connection is just connecting three wires. You can connect four. The red one is the power. Uh, but here I'm just using the ground, the black one, and then reception and transmission for my data to come in between my laptop and my Pi. Okay. Uh, another advice, piece of advice, uh, really use a proper power supply or things will also get messy. So for instance, my Wi-Fi will stop working at some time, at some moment, and I, wa I won't have any idea why. Uh, power supply is very important for any uh, IoT device. So if you have to remember one thing is that just give stable power to your device, okay? And, and that way you will be pretty safe. Okay, then uh, you have your serial console. Um, and you can access uh, to the Pi. It's a low-level uh, access. You can even, if you're developing in low-level, you can even change the bootloader, the first part that is starting before the OS is starting, okay? Uh, the only drawback is that it's slower than SSH, but you have uh, the full control over your device with the serial uh, console. Then, of course, once you have uh, control, uh, you can customize everything. So. One thing you need to do if you're going to work with uh, different uh, peripherals here is to launch Raspi config and enable SPI and I2C. So those are two data buses that you find on any board. Enable them, and that way the rainbow hat, so the peripheral that is plugged on top of the Pi, is going to work. Okay, and you're going to be able to control the Pi or use services that control the, the different peripherals. 
Of course, like on any device, you can configure the Ethernet. So if you're working at home or at work, then it might be handy. Once you have connectivity, then you can SSH directly to the device. So like the serial, it's like serial, but it's faster. Uh, but if something is wrong, then it won't work, right? Because SSH only works when the OS has started. Okay, um, then you're ready to start to work. But before you start to work, please, please, please uh, get your device up to date. Uh, so last time I did it from scratch, it took three minutes. Really, uh, it's cool to start having coffee before uh, working. Really, it could save you hours later. So you really take this time to, to update your device. Okay. Here, I'm using Wi-Fi, so I didn't want to mess up with... Two, I have already too many wires. Um, one thing important with Wi-Fi is to define uh, the country. You know, the Wi-Fi channels don't are not available, uh, are not the same in all uh, countries. So that's pretty much what I did for Wi-Fi to work on my Pi here. And then you can think about starting to develop. So what's cool with the Pi is that you have a full set of dev solution pre-installed. So you have many runtimes, and of course you have Python. And you have also uh, different Python packages. So for instance, oops, sorry, you have NumPy, you have Flask, Jinja2, and Rainbow Hat. So the Rainbow Hat is pre-installed, so it means I don't have to do anything, and I can still uh, I can start to 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 play with the the hat. And also one thing uh, is uh, the package RPI GPIO is pre-installed, so it means it's like a driver to it's the layer between um, the the low-level hardware and the driver. So thanks to GPIO, you're going to be able to use Rainbow Hat and the data will be uh, up and down uh, between uh, Rainbow Hat and the hardware. Okay, the, I'm using VS Code as an IDE, uh, so I needed to get my files onto the device, my Python files, okay? So what I chose to use, there are different solutions. If, uh, if you use SSH, it's okay. I used SSH but with SFTP, so there's a uh, plug in uh, SFTP for VS Code, and the only thing you need to do is give the IP address and the credentials, and then you're connected. And whenever you save the file that you modified, it's uploaded onto the Pi. Okay? So now let's get started. So, first of all, there's a display uh, on the Pi. Okay, there are segmented displays here. So, let me check. Am I in the right? Okay. Okay, so, yeah, this first, um, this first code, uh, f um, sorry, this first program, so you see I'm using Rainbow Hat, I'm using the display class, and what I'm going to do is just display some random digit, and that's it. So just, just a few lines, and you can already do something fancy on your Pi. So, okay, so it's displaying random digits, and whenever I stop, it will display, yeah, uh, maybe you don't see it well, but it's the answer to the universe. Okay, so you can see the exception, I use that. Okay, so next, uh, you, you have LEDs. So likewise, you use the rainbow uh, class, um, and you can set anything, the brightness, the color that you want. Uh, the speed also uh, um, with which you can cycle in. And here I'm just uh, browsing through the different colors. Okay, so you see. So a few lines, pretty easy to use in Python. Okay, so next, um, as an output, you have a uh, you have a buzzer, a piezo buzzer. So I, I won't show the result here. It's easy to use, but it's not even a gadget. It's the, the, the volume is very low, so you won't hear anything. But think that you can work with uh, audio uh, on a Raspberry, but don't use the, the rainbow hat, okay? Uh, it's really not useful. Uh, then you have capacitive buttons. So they are here. And you have a small LED for each of them. So what I did here is just plugged some callbacks uh, to simulate or to show when a button is pressed or released. OK. 
Okay. So you see. Okay, so I can physically control my device. Easy. I have some inputs. Then we have uh, sensors. So here there's this small chip here, um, which is able to give you the pressure and the temperature. So likewise, you use the weather class from Rainbow Hat, and you can immediately get the pressure and the temperature. So very easy. So let's check that out. Okay, so I have the pressure and the temperature, 39 degrees. Are you hot? <laughs> so there's something wrong, right? Uh, okay, so here, it's a design uh, flow. Uh, this small chip is accurate enough, but it's right in the middle of the board, and this board is on top of the pie. And the CPU is emitting a lot of heat. And likewise, when the LEDs, LEDs are working, they will also emit heat. So this sensor is getting heat from every, everything, from everywhere, and is not really measuring the, the actual temperature of this room, right? So that's why we, we have 39 degrees here. So let's try to do something. And OK, so sorry, first I will do this impersonation of Master Yoda, but for you to remember. Mm, sensors to skill? Mm, calibrate, you will. So just for you to remember that, um, <laughs> you can make fun of me. Um, whenever you're going to deal with sensors, uh, you mostly will have also to deal with calibration. Okay, so here we are dealing with temperature, uh, and we have to isolate this component. And maybe also we will have to, to define some offset, okay, to, to have the, the accurate temperature. So let's try to do something uh, to have a calibrated temperature. So I am getting this heat from the CPU. Uh, so I should somehow remove it, right? So here, uh, to get a calibrated temperature, I'm getting the, C the, the, the actual temperature from the CPU. This one is accurate. And I'm trying to remove some of it, so 25% here, to get a better calibrated temperature. Okay, so let's check what we have then. Okay, so still 39, but the calibrated temperature is now 27.5. Still incorrect, right? Better, but incorrect. So just to, <laughs> uh, there's no way with this system that we're going to have. Uh, a good temperature, but it's a bit better, okay? So it's a, a workaround. Uh, the idea, of course, is if you work with an IoT device, get the design right at the, at the, at the beginning. Otherwise, it will be hard to, to, to work properly uh, later on. Okay, so we have a calibrated temperature. So now, now I have these metrics, and I would like to upload them. I don't want to check, I don't have to check on the device what is the temperature and so on. I want to be able to check anywhere in the world. So what I can use is a metrics warehouse. So like a database, but a warehouse where I can stream all my data. And one solution for that is BigQuery that I chose. Uh, it's pretty cool, it's serverless, uh, and also it's able to handle petabytes of data, okay? Here I'm just going to upload a few bytes, I think. So, but still, uh, it's scalable. So what I need to do then, uh, I have my metrics, I need to prepare my code to be able to stream, and it's like a database, so what I'm going to do is just prepare my code to work on a raw basis, okay? So here, I have this method, and what I do is, I, whenever I call it, I return a row, and what I, I'm using is the timestamp, I, need to be, I want to know when the, the metrics have been taken, I have a device name. If I'm going to use several devices, then it's cool to, to know the device uh, I have. So here it's Asimov. Uh, and then the, the different metrics. So here I have prepared my code for live streaming, OK? Uh, let's check. OK, so you see, every second I have the pressure and the temperature from Asimov. Okay, so it works, I have my different rows, I, I can get going. 
So then I'm going to start with uh, cloud uh, services. So the first thing you have to know, it's project-based. So I created a project, Icon Balkan. Okay, cool. Everything is project-based. Uh, so whenever you use the services, you will mention the project ID. Okay, then installation phase. Uh, I want to be able to do that from the Pi, so I use the cloud SDK. So it takes two minutes. But that's the usual way you work with Debian here. You install um, packages. Then you initialize your environment for the cloud. It takes three minutes. It's a one-shot, right? And then I'm using cloud BigQuery. So the other thing I need to do is install the client library. So it takes two minutes. And I can do that with PIP. And then I'm ready. So I have this BigQuery tool. It's like a database. Uh, it's going to handle two concepts, a data set and tables. So what I prepared here is a small Python code to create the data set if it's not there and create the table if it's not there, or just then reach a uh, uh, return the table uh, if it's available. And what you can see is that I define a Raspberry data set, I define a metrics table, and I define the schema for the table. And the schema is exactly uh, the different values from the row that I previously showed you. Okay, so let's check that. So normally I remove the everything, so it's going to uh, detect that there's no data set, so it's created, and that there's no table, so now I have my table. So let's check that here. So this is the cloud console. Okay, so I have my Raspberry data set, and I have my metrics table, and I can check uh, the schema here. Okay, cool. So it's ready. And what is the next step? I have prepared my code. I have my BigQuery table. So I can stream now to BigQuery. So the only thing I, I need to do is to slightly adapt my code to upload the data, to stream the data. And the additional lines are BigQuery client. So I create a client that's a wrapper around the BigQuery API. I get the table. And then I can insert rows. And what I chose to do here is every five seconds to get rid of my metrics and upload them to BigQuery. OK? So it's up to you to define what is best for your model. You, maybe you don't want to uh, lose some too much data. And maybe also you want to be able to do some real-time uh, queries to, to get that. So let's check whether it works. So in the, in the meantime, I got a question uh, regarding uh, pre-installed Python 2.7 or 3. Uh, it used to be only 2.7, but now uh, we have everything. Okay, and even in the cloud, now we have also 2.7 and 3.7. So we have the latest versions, and as you know, uh, Python 2.7 is going to be obsolete quite soon. Uh, so we all should start to move to Python 3.7 and so on. Okay, so as you can see, uh, uh, my Pi has been streaming every five seconds. Uh, uh, maybe you cannot see it yet, but let's check that. So uh, I have my table here. Okay. It's empty. It's actually streaming. And okay, let's refresh that. I'm going to do uh, some real time query. Okay. Oops. It's a bit small. Okay, let's check that. Oops. Okay, so I can use uh, uh, SQL uh, uh, queries uh, to get the results. So here I'm going to count how many um, how many uh, metrics I uploaded. Okay, 65. Let's check something else. What is, uh, for instance, the minimum and maximum calibrated temperature that I got? OK, so you see it's a really like a SQL one. So 
It's faster than that usually because it works in two different modes. In batch mode, so for instance, if you have years of data, it has been already, it's already packed, packed in, uh, uh, in the, the table. And also I have some streaming data that is coming live, so the streaming data takes uh, a bit more time. But so you see here how much inaccurate it is because it's, it has been fluctuating between 28 and 29 uh, degrees. Uh, yeah, 0.5 uh, magnitude. Uh, but anyone can so use these metrics live thanks to such a tool. And if I had millions of devices and billions or, or more uh, of metrics, uh, it would take the same time because this kind of tool uh, is actually able to, you know, it's map radius, right? So it's able to give you the result. Even though you have petabytes of data, you will get something in the 10, 15 seconds range. Okay? So I've showed you how you can upload your metrics to the cloud. So that's a pr generic principle that you can use. Can we do more? Yeah. So this device is to, supposed to stay at home, for instance, but I'm elsewhere and I want to be able to pilot this. So we can think about many different complex solutions. Yeah, the first thing would be, yeah, I'm going to open some web sockets and some, something, but I will need to set up the firewall and so on and so But there's something easier that you can use. You can actually use, you can decouple your architecture and you can use some asynchronous messaging. So maybe you know RabbitMQ, uh, maybe you know PubSub. Who knows the PubSub paradigm? Okay, very, very few. Okay, so PubSub is very interesting. It's a principal uh, paradigm. Uh, Pub is for publisher, uh, sub is for subscriber. And in between, you have the messaging uh, handling. So you can plug as many publishers as you want. You create a topic, publishers and subscribers. Publishers will be able to send messages, and subscri subscribers will get the messages. Uh, and it's a guarantee. All the subscribers will get the message for sure. So it's interesting, because if my Pi is switched off, if there's an issue, then whenever it's on again, it will get the messages that the subscribers sent. Okay, so if I want to control the dev a device, might be uh, might be uh, cool. Uh, for instance, if there's an issue uh, with the network, also uh, my Pi is going eventually to get the the, mes the message or the command that I wanted to send. Okay, so I'm going to use PubSub also because it's scalable. So likewise for BigQuery, I can just uh, use PubSub with the client library, it takes one minute, less and less, because all the different packages are going to be installed. I enable the API, and then here's the code to create, um, yeah, to create a topic. Let's check that. Oops, okay. That's number 10. So first, it's the first time I'm using a PubSub here. So it's going to detect that there's no topic, and so it has created the RPI command topic. And next, the second or third time I'm using it, the topic is here, so it's just going to use it right away. Okay, so perfect. I have a topic, so anyone can publish to this topic. But next, I want my Pi to receive commands. So what I can do is use the Pi as a sus subscriber, and here is the code. Uh, so like before, I create a client, I create a subscription, and then I can subscribe and give a callback, and I will get my messages here. Okay, so let's try that. Okay, so... I have my topic, now my code has subscribed to the topic. So I'm going to go to the, to the console to check that. Okay, refresh. Okay, I have my topic here, and I have one subscriber, Asimov. This is my device. Uh, but here I could have uh, thousands of them. So let's send a message. Okay, publish my message. And here, the Raspberry already received the message, okay? 
Uh, and then you can think about uh, sending commands, like I want the de device to get out of its loop. I can send stop, and then my Pi will return. Okay, so pretty easy, a few lines, and I have something very uh, efficient and very consistent uh, that, will, uh, we, we, that is robust to failure. Okay. So, I'm able to export data, I'm able to control my device. Now my device might be uh, able to generate many files or big files, and of course, like the metrics, I don't want uh, these files to stay on the Pi. I want to be able to use the files elsewhere, and likewise, I might be able to consider using an external drive, but could be stolen, could fail, and so on. So the cloud, again, is pretty, pretty neat, because it will be uh, performant, and also uh, I will not lose my files, okay? So what I added here uh, is a media vault, so I want to store some media files from the Pi. That's just cloud storage, okay? And that's the basis of any cloud uh, provider, right? Uh, it's very cheap, so you can really think about using that. And uh, one concept is the concept of a bucket. So a bucket is like a folder in the cloud. So like before, I'm using uh, the cloud storage. Uh, so I installed uh, the cloud storage package. It takes 30 seconds this time, less and less. And then the code to actually use that is even simpler. So I create a client. I check whether the bucket is there. If it's not, then I create the bucket. Uh, and then I can, I can use it right away. So a file can be considered as a blob. And then here what I'm going, going, going to do is upload a file from the Pi to the cloud, to the bucket, and then download the file from the bucket to the Pi again with different names. So it's going to take actually the source code itself and you see it has been uploaded and downloaded. So it's small, this is why it's so fast. Let's check that in the console. So those are the buckets I created for, um, for the project. And here in media, yeah, I have something that just got created. It's the upload from Raspberry. And that's actually the source code itself that got uploaded. Okay. And if I go back to my Pi, Okay, let me show you that differently. Okay, you can see that the, the file that was uh, in the cloud has been downloaded again as a copy here, just right now. Okay. Okay, so another service is that comes pretty handy. But everything so far has been very simple, okay? So you might think in real life it's more complicated than that. And yeah, that, that's right. Usually it's more complicated, but it's like Lego bricks, right? If you understand how you can use that, then you can do a lot more uh, and be still very efficient. So for instance, uh, I have here a high defi de definition camera. It's plugged to my, la to my laptop. But if I plug it to the Pi, will it work? Actually, yeah, it will work right away. It's a standard uh, USB cam. Uh, the only thing I need is like before, a package to handle that. There's one called OpenCV, uh, so that you can install. It takes 20 seconds. And the code to use it is also very, very simple. Uh, you create so your camera. You check whether the camera is here. Then you set the resolution. And one thing, you remember when I talked about uh, calibration issues. Uh, a camera is a sensor, and a camera needs to autofocus, right? And so I also had to deal with calibration issues with this camera. So the workaround I used here, I could do something more low level, but the workaround I used is to skip a few frames at the beginning, so here 40 frames, to let, to give some time to the camera to autofocus, okay? Uh, so let's try that. So first, I'm going to turn the camera towards you, so it's a bit big crowd, so I will not get all of you. So let's get started. Sorry, it's you. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe some autofocus. 
So here it's on my uh, laptop, right? So I unplug that, so now it's over, and I plug it to the Pi. Okay, so it's standard, so it works. I didn't have to do uh, anything fancy. And so what I'm going to do is, what is the number 13? So launch this code. So it's going to detect that there's a camera. It's autofocused, so right now it's switched on. It has taken the picture and saved the picture. And that's the photo I have here. 40 frames skipped and I gave a timestamp. Okay, cool. So I did something a bit more complex. I'm able to control my device, to get information, to send commands, and also now I'm able to get a picture uh, of anything that is in the room uh, nearby the, the Pi. Cool, cool. Uh, so does it work all together? Yeah, so you've seen a few, a few functions so far. So I, I put them all together. So it's uh, roughly 200 lines. Uh, I combine everything. So let's check that. Uh, we're going to stream and, and try something different. OK. OK, so it's going to recheck everything. Uh, do we have <clears throat> a bigquery table? Do we have PubSub? Uh, do we have the cloud storage just in case? Uh, and so here, the Pi is ready to work. Everything has been set up before, it's ready to work. And so it means I can send command to it. And okay, let's publish another message. And this time I'm say, I set up a command that is photo, so to ask to take a picture. Okay, so uh, smile, okay. So now it's autofocus. Smile, yeah, it is uploading now, so it's finished. And I should see, uh, if I refresh here, yeah, I should see the picture that has been taken. Is it good enough? Oh, yeah, very good quality. Cool, so I don't want anyone to be jealous, so let's take another one. And sorry for, for these who won't be on the picture, but that's already a very good result. Uh, without, without much calibration, okay? Okay, the second picture, smile, smile, smile. Focus, okay, it's uploading. And if I refresh the bucket, I should have a second picture, yeah. Uh, which one, so fast, okay, this one? No, not this one, the second one. Okay, okay, cool. So it works, you see, it is that simple. Uh, so, next step. So, I'm able to do something fancy on my uh, Pi, but more and more I will have uh, more code on this device, and it's going to be painful to update the device, and even more if I have more devices. So, how can I update the code that is on my device? I don't want to... Uh, in the past, in my previous life, I developed something uh, special. Uh, we were using Linux and so on, so we... I wouldn't do that uh, anymore. Uh, if you're using Android, you have something uh, available. If you're using, maybe you can use some um, package uh, updating mechanism. But there's one thing I wanted to show you today. Uh, if you have a code that you, simple code or code that you often have to update on a device, maybe you can think about microservices. And there's something we call cloud function. Uh, called Elsewhere Lambda, maybe you know, you know that. So I added something more. I added some Python code here, and what's cool is just one function. And this function can be triggered either manually, so if I hit an HTTP endpoint, I can trigger the code. It can be triggered with a PubSub message automatically, but also it can be triggered uh, with uh, a cloud storage. So when a new file is on the storage, it will automatically call, call the code. So that's what I did. I didn't want to add more code on the Pi, so I put some code, I, I have put some code into the cloud. So let me show you that code here. So 
This is a cloud function, so it's already in the cloud. It takes 20 to 30 seconds, 30 seconds the first time, and then 20 seconds to upload, uh, to deploy, actually. It's code that we deploy into the cloud. And uh, here is the code that I used. So like before, I'm using cloud storage. So whenever there's a file that is going to be uploaded uh, into the bucket, I'm going to be notified. And this function is going to be called straight away. And what I'm, I'm doing here, additionally, I'm using a machine learning API. So I'm using the Cloud Vision API. So that way, with the picture that I took here, uh, I'm able to know, for instance, if there are faces in the picture. Okay, so like before, I can create cli clients, then I can check whether it's a, a picture or not. And then what I'm doing here is calling face detection, but not on the device, I'm calling that in the cloud with a machine learning API. And then I know if there are different faces, okay? Uh, and what I'm doing additionally um, here, so I get the source image, and I'm using into the cloud, I'm using image magic, right? That's a wrapper around image magic wand. Um, and so I can create small uh, cro uh, cropped faces. And like before, I can upload them into a bucket. Okay, and so it's, it was real time. I already did it, so it's, it's been finished for a lot, some time but let me show you what we should get. So those are your faces that were recognized in the two pictures we took. I guess you see, see yourself in the first rows, right? So you see how that simple it is? Uh, with a function in the cloud, I'm able to do a lot more, okay? So it's a bit blurry because uh, uh, there are not many pixels, right? So it has been a little bit upscaled uh, in, my, in my view. Okay, so we've seen how we can trigger uh, that um, with code in the, in the cloud. It's a little bit magic for me because um, in the past it was not that simple. So new question, does it scale uh, to several devices? Because here I have one. If I had two or three, it would work the same and I could actually have a few dozens without any problem. I didn't do anything special. Everything is scalable, so it means I can add as many uh, devices as I want, and then I can, so here, and I can also have as many users as I want. It will scale automatically. So that's the secret of a serverless architecture. Really think about that. Um, you will save a lot of time, and it works in um, all uh, major uh, public clouds. Okay, so it scales automatically, and. At the opposite, if nobody is using that, so if I, if I have no Raspberry Pi, if I have no user, it will scale down, right? And I will not pay anything. Maybe I will pay a couple of cents because I have pictures that stay in a cloud storage, but that's, that's the cheapest. And if I'm not using it, everything else is free. Okay, and then does it scale to millions of devices? So yes, it would scale to millions of devices, but you wouldn't do it that way, right? Uh, so I, in my previous life, I didn't uh, actually manufacture millions of devices, but hundreds of thousands, so that's still a lot. Um, and it's hard to manage that, okay? So first of all, uh, you need to have your code on the devices right from the factory when you manufacture them. Uh, that's really something you need to, to do and think about. Uh, when, for instance, if you, you, you make your, start, your own startup, right? So there are solutions for that. Uh, uh, at Google, we have a cloud IoT core where we can actually help you to get uh, the devices manufactured. Uh, everything will be natively uh, cloud uh, enabled. And so that's the, the, the same kind of architecture, but we have an additional module on the device itself at the factory that will help you to manage the fleet of devices. But everything else is just what you saw, the different modules. You can use cloud functions, pep subs, and so on, and, and even machine learning if you need. Some companies are using that, for instance, to put sensors on their trucks, on their machinery, to be able to get metrics and to be able to detect uh, whenever 
uh, a device is going to fail in advance. Okay, ahead of time, they are going to predict uh, and be more efficient regarding uh, maintenance of their device fleet. Okay, so I hope <laughs> at one stage uh, you might, if you're here, then it means you're going to do something serious, uh, but anything uh, works. So it's time to wrap up. Um, I will give that to you a few pointers uh, for more explanation, and uh, I will try to answer a few questions. Right? Uh, any thoughts? So I'm not an expert. Uh, I started Python uh, about one year ago, so, so I'm still ashamed when I see the code that I wrote one year ago. Uh, any thoughts of, on setting up a, a Kafka cluster with Raspberry Pi? So it's possible. I haven't done that. Uh, but you can actually do anything. It's like a computer. It's a server. You can consider the Raspberry Pi as a server. So I've seen people... Uh, uh, setting up a cluster of Kubernetes, uh, a Kubernetes cluster with Raspberry Pis, so it's just like servers if you want. Uh, I wouldn't. It's yeah, it's fun to do. I wouldn't advise to do it because it's not a professional solution, right? A Raspberry Pi can fail at any moment, uh, and and then how, how how do you do? Okay, so you can do it, of course, and and a Kafka cluster would work too. Uh, it's it's like a com it's a computer. It's an actual computer. So. Uh, I've have, I don't have more details because I haven't done it, so Kafka Cluster, yes, I'm sure you can do it, but it's up to you to do it, okay. Uh, do, so regarding the cost of running uh, the shown GCP services for a uh, length of time, so as I told you, uh, it's serverless. So it will, uh, there's always a free tier, so it means if you're not using, uh, if you're using the service up to a certain threshold, it will be free. And then above that threshold means it's a professional solution, then you will start to pay. So for instance, um, uh, with uh, some computing machines, I have uh, a teammate who has uh, his own block uh, with a cloud solution for 10 years, and he has paid zero dollars so far because he has some traffic, but not that much. So everything is either related to the size of the data that you have or to the, 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 the time of the computing power that you need. Uh, and you have a threshold below which it's free, and then uh, you will start to pay. Uh, let's be fully transparent and check um, how much I should pay for this demo. Um, I set it up yesterday, so let's go to the Cloud Console. Okay. The cool thing also is that we are very transparent. We tell you, okay, so you see here, this demo will cost me two cents. Okay, of course I haven't done much, but uh, I did some uh, tests uh, yesterday. Okay, so that's what I did here is basically zero. Okay. Uh, next question. Yeah, can you compare uh, with the competition? Yeah, I, I won't compare uh, because I'm not objective, right? So it's up to you to compare. You will find some comparisons uh, on the web. Uh, we are uh, in the top three for sure. Uh, we are growing fast, uh, and what I know, but you could say I'm biased, uh, we are very performant and, and uh, we work a lot on security. So that's all I will tell you. But yeah, you will find many comparisons, um, benchmarks, uh, and you can trust any of the three clouds uh, that have been mentioned here. Then uh, how is data transport security handled? Uh, TLS, yeah, of course. Uh, it's everything is uh, secured by default. So whenever there's a communication, it's encrypted by default. Uh, in the console, you can see uh, that Google actually uses some keys for everything. Uh, storage is uh, is secured by default. You can even uh, define your own keys uh, to encipher and decipher the content if you want, if you need additional security layers. But, but in a cloud, and I think everywhere, uh, it's secured by default, okay? Uh, and last question, will it run um, with MicroPython on an ESP8266? So it's a very precise question. So I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, 
nah, I'm not sure. So I won't answer this question. What I know is that we're working uh, with ESP. So an ESP is a microchip, so it's a microcontroller. So it's, it's very cheap. It's like $1 instead of 35 but you cannot run a, ras a Raspberry, um, you cannot run a Debian distribution on an ESP. You can only run a micro OS, right? So maybe MicroPython would work, and anyway, I guess all the efforts from the ESP manufacturer are towards that. Uh, but what I know is that IoT Core, we're working on I IoT Core and ESP microchips because they're so low cost, and they have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, that you can actually think about building, for instance, this with an ESP and be able to stream, uh, to stream the metrics. For instance, the, the example that I gave you, the small sensors that are in the trucks, measuring temperature, measuring vibrations, uh, and all other, other metrics are handled with ESPs and uploaded uh, into the cloud with a very small uh, solution. Okay, so thank you very much for having me today. This is my first PyCon. You can uh, ping me on Twitter uh, on Picard Paris. Uh, please, 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 uh, I very uh, much look forward to improving this talk, so feel free to send me any feedback to this address. Uh, I hope you learned a few tricks, and ideally that it gave you a few ideas. Thanks again for having me. Uh, have a great PyCon. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so this is my first PyCon. Uh, it's a great experience. Uh, I decided uh, I'm, I'm doing Python for only one year now, so I decided to focus on Python. And we can already, I can already cool, do cool stuff with Python, so it's really a lot of fun. And for first Python, I'm pretty impressed. And this is almost my first Python, but also your first Python. So congratulations! It's a great event.